Somebody, they asked me, they said, is there really that much in the shout? Yeah, that and more. My, my response is, are there, is there really that much in the silence? Is there really that much in not having passion? Well, the Bible doesn't talk about it, so there must be very little in it. I mean, you know, God does talk about being still, but that, that's really talking, being still and knowing that He's God, but that's not talking about still within the framework of what men might think about being silent and quiet and not passionate. That's, being, that's rather being dependent upon God cleaving to Him. Ah, ah, that's being a hoopamoniite. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the fire of the Holy Ghost. Father, we thank you for lighting your people on fire with passion from heaven. With the flow of your divine glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> See, the Bible describes what praise ought to look like. There's going to be a time here tonight that you can sit down and you can be quiet if you want. But, but when it's praise, when it's about praise and worship, it has to be by the Holy Ghost and everywhere it's defined, it's defined with a shout, with a, with a clap, with a dance, with a high-sounding cymbal, with the sounds of joy and rejoicing. Alleluia. <laughs> Alleluia. <laughs> Alleluia. <laughs> Alleluia. <laughs> Lord, we praise you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Now, now, I believe that everybody has to come to understand that there is a human voice and that there is a divine voice. And it's okay to start off with the human voice because I know some of you may have just come from work and it may have been one of those hard days. Don't quit playing. Can I, could you, can I, can I be in charge just for a little while? Then you can have it back. Okay? Just stay with me over here. Ah, hallelujah. It's just the hardest thing, you know. I, I know the Holy Ghost is saying that all the time to us. Of course, he's not saying I want to give it back, but, you know, he knows it's pretty the inevitable. He's long-suffering and patient and merciful as we walk out our lives with our sensual way of living, what we see with our eyes and hear with our ears and understand with our own rational thinking but I'm telling you, listen to me. I want you to, I know, I'm not interested in people becoming emotional. I'm interested in people participating with the power of the living God that really ultimately comes out of a realm uh, of, of your extreme yieldedness. And what does it take to be that? Because what is it that rules you and controls you? That's what defines you. That's why we say, well, this person is this and this person is that. We want the Holy Ghost to rule you and control you. We want, we've discovered from the Word of God, Father has shown us. He hasn't leave, left us to figure in this out. He's shown us how to come in. He shows us how to come in with shouts of joy, with rejoicing and with praise and with thanksgiving. He, uh -huh, uh -huh. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving, with his courts with praise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, you are going to be extremely hard-pressed to find anybody within the culture of the people of God who define praise with anything less than a shout and with a dance and with a clap and with a tambourine and with the drums and with the string instruments. Hallelujah. 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 You know, you know, you know, I, I, I've never really been into the choreographic thing, the chore, uh, choreography, rather, the choreography thing. But that's better than what people are doing around here. You with me? Should I say it again? That's better than standing there going. I tell you, I'll go with the choreograph. 
I go with the choreographed and people having their hands in their pocket. Are you with me? Are you with me? I go with the day. I mean, I want to see some movement. I mean, it's good to see some movement and some life in the, in the, among the people of God. And, and people, I want you to understand. There is a realm that Father has got to bring us, that wants to bring us to. And if we need to go ahead and give you guys lessons in, in choreography and get you there, I mean, I do whatever it takes. I do whatever it takes. I mean, I do whatever it takes. I mean, come on. If I need to put a tambourine in everybody's hand, if I need to hug you and give you a kiss, I, whatever it takes. Some of you I'm not going to give a kiss to, but I mean, you know, if I need to hug you. Are you with me? Amen. I'm not kissing anybody with whiskers. Just not going to do it. Hallelujah. No, 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 no. No, no, no. I'm just talking to you about you touching heaven and you going into a realm. I want to talk to you tonight about you living in a realm. And if I, if I cannot see measurably you going into that realm, you cannot convince me that you know how to live in that realm. Are you listening to me? Man, if you can't go into that realm because you can't hook up with a song, what are you doing when you're being tempted, when you're being overwhelmed by the powers of darkness? Give me a break. You, you capitulate, and that's what you're doing. You ain't making it. You listen to me. Oh, you can't tell me. I know. I know these things. I know these things. Because all human beings are just a bunch of look-alikes and act-alikes. And, and, you know, come on. And Father, by the way, has taught us very clearly the only way that it will work, the only way that we can be overcomers. And that's really what it's all about. Hallelujah. And now from here on out, from this day forward, I don't ever have to give this instruction again. If we're singing words you don't know, you can just go. And a hallelujah in between. So there's no reason that anybody shouldn't have their 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 lips moving. You know what I'm saying? Okay, right, if you can't do it, because you're not that whatever fluent, just go. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. What a song. I love you, Jesus. And then turn it around. Jesus, I love you. Ha ha, hallelujah. Ha ha. What a song. I love you, Jesus. Ha ha ha. Jesus, I love you. Oh, hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. Ha ha. Jesus, I love you. Ma, 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 ma. I love you, Jesus. Ha ha. Jesus, I love you. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Ha ha. And Jesus, I love you. Oh, hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Oh, hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. Come on now. Come on. Oh, Jesus, I love you. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I love you. Woo-hoo! I love you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I love you. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, I love you. Come on, I'm going to hear you. Okay, stop. That's in my hearing. I can't hear nobody. Go ahead. I love you, Jesus. Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it now, I got it now, I got it now. We can fix you here tonight. We can fix you here tonight. We can, we can, we can doctor you up in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Tonight, if you would let us, we'll change your whole life. Tonight, if you would let us, we'll change your entire, we'll change your entire life. And you're, we're going to be able to diagnose whether or not that you've been changed because when you've been changed and when you begin to cooperate, it's like, 
I love you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I love you. And let me see if I can have a, 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 a non-singing voice, a voice that can't sing. Okay, see if I can still do it. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. So it doesn't matter what, whether you can sing or not, how raw your voice is. It's where your heart's at. It's where your passions are. It's where, you, it's where the river is. So I want you to go ahead and go with, I love you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I love you. Go ahead, sing them. Okay, stop a second. Stop a second. That's really good. What's the problem? Well, yeah, it is. Why wasn't it that way to start with? There is a problem. What's wrong? You just didn't know. Did you feel like you didn't have that kind of liberty? Let's try that again. That's, that works. Go ahead. Oh, hallelujah, I love you, Jesus. Hey, people, I'm going to tell you something. That's pretty good. You know, we're doing choir practice for heaven here tonight. It's choir practice. I know you thought it was a Wednesday night meeting. It's choir practice for heaven. And who knows? You may be there in the morning. We just want you to be well prepared. I know about coming out there, you know, coming, walking into the realms of heaven. And the Lord said, what church did you just come out of? Because you're sitting there going, I love you, Jesus. Jesus. He's like, what in the lid ain't going to work. Like, who let him in here? Come on now. Hallelujah. Ha, come on. Come on now. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Huh? I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Oh, hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Uh, I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Oh, hallelujah, I love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I praise you, Jesus. Jesus, I praise you. I praise you, Jesus. Jesus, I praise you. Oh, hallelujah, I praise you, Jesus. Jesus, I praise you. Amen. Listen, I mean, you just got to find some simple little song in your heart like that. Just find, just, just play just a little bit more. Just, is it Roland, is, is the piano at all on? 
Is it working? I love you, Jesus. You know, you can, you can do the, all day on that. Jesus, I love you. Now, how hard is that? And don't think, oh, my, I can get it copyrighted. Don't you, you know what I'm saying? Oh, just wait till they hear me over there. Because he's hearing you there, here, right now. I want to move this into a place of reality with you people. I've come here tonight to talk to you about reality. I've come here to talk to you about a place to stand in the realms of God's goodness. I, talk to you, I want to come here and talk to you about a place where you can teach your children to live so that they won't miss out on all the good things of heaven. I want to show you how easy it is to get into prophecy. Look, look. How many of you can easily slip into prophesying right now? Raise your hand. Okay, then why don't you come prophesy? Come prophesy. Listen to me. I'm asking you an honest question before the Lord because I'm just really wanting to make a point. It is actually to go into prophecy is real easy. You just got to know the entrance in. And, I, and you, can say, you can say, well, look, I, I want to do it my way or I, I'm not fully convinced that what you're saying is right. Listen, I'll prophesy right now. I'll flow in tongues, interpretation in tongues right now. I'll go ahead and deliver the word of the Lord. I'll go ahead and, and move in signs, wonders, and miracles right now. I found a way in. All I'm doing is working with you to help you understand that there is a way in for you so that you can prophesy tonight. You can begin to flow in the, in the gifts of the Spirit now, not later. Don't defer it anymore. We don't, have more, we don't have any more time to wait. There's no more time. There's no more time. There has to be the manifest presence of Jesus that brings Holy Ghost conviction and the Word of God that proclaims it. And we've got to have people that know how to step into that realm. And the only way you're ever going to learn how to step in that realm on your own, because you know what? I'm thinking, okay, Father, how many people in the place can go and be evangelists right now? If you give them my microphone, are there, is there going to be a move of God? You know, come on now. How many people, oh God, are able to move into the office of pastoral ministry and it's not going to be some boring, dead, dried up thing, but the power of God's going to be moving in all the dimensions of ministry that's supposed to be in the church will be activated. I'm thinking that way. Understand me. I'm not just looking at you tonight going, well, I'm just so blessed that you showed up. You know, I hope you brought your offering with you. I'm not thinking that way. Are you with me? Everybody just wave at me. Okay. I'm thinking about you getting released into the realms of divine power and glory. I'm thinking about you getting perfected. I'm thinking about you getting strengthened and you getting equipped. That's all. I'm not thinking about nothing else. I'm not thinking about you getting saved because I'm looking around here tonight and everybody I know in this place is saved. Okay, I'm not thinking of, are you with me here, people? Here's what I used to do with my kids. Here's what I used to do with my kids. I wanted to know what was going on in their life. I'd have said, let me hear your spirit pray. Pray in the spirit. See, the other day, I was talking to someone. I hadn't talked to them in a little while. And I was praying for them. They were in a need. And as soon as they begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, I go, oh, yeah, there we go. Praise God, you in the realm. Because I, it, I, there's a big difference between all of a sudden trying to play catch up trying to get in that realm and living in the realm. I want to talk to you tonight about living in the realm. But how can you live in the realm of divine glory where the river's constantly flowing out, where the glory of heaven has manifested your life if you don't even know how to enter in? Because otherwise, all you're going to be doing is you're going to get to step in and out when there is an anointing strong enough to get you in. So, in other words, where there's a meeting, uh, where a group of ministers have met together, a power God's present, I mean, you gotta, you got to be a rock to resist it kind of thing, you know. Are you with me? See, here's what I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is here, and I believe that the manifestation of the Holy Ghost is here, and that the manifestation of God is here. And, I'm, I, and I believe this, that if you do not have the manifestation of God, the Holy Ghost, you will have the manifestation of demon spirits. I believe this. I am convinced of it. You listen to me. I'm going to be radical tonight. I'm going to minister some radical stuff. So you might as well just get built up in the faith right now so you can be able to endure what you're going to hear. Are you listening to me? Somebody said, well, how about babyhood, Pastor? How about babyhood? Fine. I was, look, we've got time for babyhood. But like the old preacher said, I don't want to have to part the whiskers to put the bottle in. 
Okay? No one else could do that? You don't feel that? That is a, that is a, that is a corporate, in, that, that right there, what I just did in the spirit, is actually a corporate tongue that is actually drink for you. That if you could hear that and respond to it, if you could drink off of the things of the spirit, it will activate in you, your spirit, the exact same thing. Okay, it will, the same realm with prophecy. When you begin to understand how to function in the anointing, how to receive from God, as soon as someone begins to prophesy, that prophecy will be activated in you. Then you get to know whether it was from God or not. Yeah, but you know what? If you don't know how to have that activated in you, you haven't even got any right to judge. You're going to try to judge based upon the content, the words they said, whether you agree or not agree. You, are you listening to me? Really, the reality of it, the same goes with miracles, signs and wonders, gifts of healing. And I, I'm telling you, I came here tonight saying, I came, well, actually, some time ago, I said, I'm going to get this job done. I'm, I'm going to stop watching people stand around just not being able to move into this place. Now, if you need me to take you one by one and show you, I will. It isn't that hard. It is so easy to receive when you are filled. Huh? The Lord says it like this. He says, don't be drunk with wine. We're in this debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourself. Ah. Babon to sigh. In the Zabaya Torah hall. In Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So he's like, he's, he's putting these two things together. It's being filled by speaking with Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Hallelujah. Sing and make a melody in your heart unto God. Praise God. So sing and make some melody. Sing and make some melody. Jesus, I love you. Because remember, 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 it's three, it's three dimensions. It's three dimensions. It's psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms is the singing prophetic songs uh, that, like the psalmist, it's with words which you can understand. How many of you have not graduated from just... Praying in the Holy Ghost, speaking in the Holy Ghost to it becoming a words which you can understand. If you haven't graduated, I want you to be able to graduate tonight. I'm giving out diplomas. I'm giving out diplomas. You can graduate tonight. If you've not graduated, how many of you, I want you to just think about it. I want you to think about this, that you could come up here and you could stand here for just a little bit. And then Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Well, well, I did it. And I told the most car and the Makia and the Makia Karanakia getting the giddy out of a shell of a Babaya. Didn't it? And a Makia to the most autonomous on the year Pranaya. Chica and a Makisha. Let me see if I could get back to where I, where I was. What I wanted, what I wanted, what I wanted to say was, how many of you could just come up here and just for a few, you know, minutes or seconds, really, just pray in the Holy Ghost, and then it bust out into a gift of the Holy Spirit, where that whether it's prophecy or or doctrine, <laughs> or knowledge or understanding or gifts of healing or word of wisdom or word of knowledge or I said that discerning of spirits. Or the activation of a gift of faith. We want that for you tonight. I'm t no spectators. In Jesus' name. We want that for you tonight. We want to sebera siyoro. We want to sebera neyate. Hikara masata la tasa. So just receive right now. It's, this is not difficult. Just receive right now. Right now. Just receive right now. Just receive right now. <laughs> Just receive right now. Just receive. 
That's it. Just receive. Just receive. Hallelujah. Malana kishikara na mamba to siprete. Ha ha ha. Ukuramande ya shana nea. Urisana na nea nea. Nana nandea of Sutoya. Mando sikiara na mana. Mana na kia shala na manana. Hallelujah. 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 Kiana Macheda na Manea. Hallelujah. Kasate Ria Bayala Lobo Sutari Mando. Kasata Radi Biatala Lomotolo Lomondebra. Hallelujah. Just receive right now. Just receive right now. Now, okay, now this is good. This is very good. Praise God for it. Praise God for it. I want you to be seated, though, for a few minutes. Because I, I'm telling you, if you will just stay there, listen to me, if you will just stay right here, you will discover a realm of divine glory. Listen to me now. I want you to stay right. I want you to understand. If you just stay right here, you will find a realm of divine glory. You'll get, ultimately, you'll get spoiled and, and won't want anything other than that which the Holy Ghost is supplying. Are you listening to me? Now, I want, I want to ruin you to where that you can't just be a plastic Christian anymore. Okay, I'm listen, I want to ruin you where you can't have some fake authority that can't stop nothing huh? or fantastical power that has no authority over sin or the works of the devil. I'm telling you, I'm done with that mess. People playing, playing pretend, huh? pray and pretend we got, I got Jesus and they got enough power to say no to the slightest little sin and iniquity. Huh? Whatever comes running around the corner takes them out. So that's why sickness and disease takes people out too. They don't even have the ability to stand up against the slightest little things that are contrary to the will of the Father. We want to teach you how to live in the will of the Father. We want to teach you how to live, I'm going to teach you how to live in the will of God, to do the Father's will. He's going to say to people, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, you never did the will of the Father. And it's my job to make sure that nobody in this room here tonight ever hears such a statement. I'm going to do everything that I can do. You know, and I don't want any interruptions while I'm doing it. Amen. Out of the realms of, of darkness. Now, if I understand, if I feel any kind of interference from Satan, I'm going to treat him tonight like I always do. I'm rough with him. <laughs> I am seriously rough with, I'm a, with the powers of darkness. I smash him. I destroy them. I speak, I speak harshly, loud to them. You with me? Okay? Just understand. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not here diddle-dallying around. I'm at war against the powers of darkness. I've been made strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of His might so that I may be able to stand up against and defeat the rulers of darkness and the spiritual wickedness that is in high places. And I want you to understand that by and large, you're going to have to learn how to do this too. Otherwise, you're not going to be an overcomer. 
You're not going to walk as more than a conqueror. You're not going to walk in that place that we have been assigned to tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. Okay? I want to get this. I want you to get this tonight. I want you to understand that if we were to continue on as we were just now doing together, the, 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 the anointing of the Holy Spirit has been over an hour. The anointing of the Holy Spirit would so captivate you that many of you would not be able to continue to stand. And that would be good because you would have an encounter in God that hopefully would last you a lifetime should you continue to take up that same interaction because it's a relationship. It's not an experience. It's an interaction. It's a relationship. And out of that interaction relationship, there does come experience, but it's not experience seeking. It's relationship seeking. It's interacting with God. I want to see God. I want to interact with him. You know, you can see God in a way that goes beyond what you can see with your eyes. That you and, and it is more impactive and, and, and it's a greater encounter. And I need to teach people this because people think that they can just live a sensual life and walk in the spirit. You cannot. You're not going to interact with God with what you see and what you hear. It's not going to happen. He's chose to retain himself or stay within an invisible realm to show us and teach us something that's far more important than what you could be taught if you saw and you heard. You understand? So that which I has not seen, I can't see it. That which ear has not heard, because ear can't hear it. That which has never entered in the heart of man, because man can't understand it. God the Holy Ghost has come to reveal these things to us. God has come to reveal these things to us by His Holy Spirit. Now, I've got to get you, and I praise God for those of you who are willing, and, and I want you to understand, those of you who don't know, I, I think you're willing, you just don't know how to get out of what you've always done. You know, we get in patterns of life, and we get real comfortable, and we think what we got fit and good. People, don't do that. Don't do that. I, I, don't, I know that what I have is good, but I know it's not that fullness and that completion of all that Father wants to do. I am fast pursuing all of His fullness, though. And so I want you to come and follow me. I want to teach you something about moving in this realm of divine glory. Now, think about this. We, we went from seven to eight. Some of this I had to activate in you. Some of this I had to provoke in you. But imagine if you started around 5.30 or 6 o'clock, if you got off of work at 5.30. Let's say it's Wednesday night, right? Most people get off of work at 5 or 5.30, right, unless you got a slave driver. Are you with me? Wave at me. Listen, I got off of work at 5 o'clock. I got off at work at 5 o'clock when I worked a secular job. I got off of work at 5 o'clock, and I always came anointed to the meeting. I always came with a manifest, and I'm talking about a manifest presence of Jesus activated in my life where the, the gifts of the Spirit could function through my life. Now, I'm telling you this because I don't, I, want, I don't want you to have an excuse. I've watched people look for every little reason and excuse. I want you to understand that we're not talking about a new covenant or a new a dimension of relationship with God, which is a better way to say it. <laughs> that is just about... Uh, the Holy Ghost, uh, the Spirit of the Lord, and the presence of the, of the Lord coming upon us for just a little while for us to do a few things, function in a certain way in the kingdom, and then lifts off of us and we're on our own. Uh, that, at best, is what happened in the Old Testament. But that's not New Testament. New Testament is where, where the dwelling place of the Holy Ghost. Now, I, I, I've got to begin to see this happen in people's lives. i got to, this nonsense this nonsense of the fruits of the devil, the fruits of sin. People believe that sin is a common, ordinary condition uh, and state of the human nature in man's life. It's not. It was taught by demon spirits and by angels of darkness. And, and, and it is a demonic nature that Christ Jesus came and delivered us from. And somehow we've got to teach the people of God how to stand upon a foundation that nobody else can lay except for that which has already been laid by Christ Jesus. And if, the, if, and if there is no foundation for the righteous to stand, what, what if, there, if, the founda if this foundation, this high ground, this place of relationship with God, if, if it's destroyed, what are the righteous going to be able to do? And so I, I've got to help God's people understand a few things here tonight. And, and, and um, help you to realize that these are perilous times and there has got to be some folks 
who know how to move in the authority of heaven, that know how not only to talk about an identity which has been given to us as the people of God, but know how to live it. Because when you begin to live it, that authority of it, it being expressed in your life becomes more and more powerful. We want you to be prepared unto every good work. We, I'm tired of seeing, closing my eyes, and seeing chains wrapped around people. Okay? I want you to say, you know what? I, I want you to say, I don't want, I want you to make up in your heart and mind that you don't want to find yourself at the end of your life having suddenly breathed out your life last breath and then spiritually behold yourself in chains. We don't want that for you. And, I, and if you go to comparing yourself with other people, then my goodness, you're going to make a terrible mistake. The only person you want to compare yourself to is Christ Jesus. The only person you want to compare yourself to is the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to be radical. I'm going to be intense. I'm not going to be anything less because I'm telling you, these are, these are radical days and intense times. Now, I want you to understand, if you open up in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, I want you to understand what God made when he made you and me. Because the scripture tells us that God came and he formed us and he shaped us in his own image and in his own likeness. God formed us with his outward appearance. Look around. Look around. God formed us with his outward appearance. Look around the people around you. God formed formed us with his outward appearance. Look around. Look, look, over, look around. God formed you with his outward appearance and with his inward likeness. He formed us and shaped us in his image, his outward appearance. If you want the Hebrew, I'll give it to you. Dalmuth. He shaped us in his outward likeness. Hallelujah. And he gave to us his inward Likeness. Hallelujah. Habakkisaya. Hallelujah. Now I want you to, that's who you and I are. That's what God created us to be. He created us to be in a place of intimacy and relationship and oneness with him. I guarantee you that when Father came walking in the garden, as you read about it in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, he did not come in anything less than all the fullness of his glory, his manifest glory. Adam was able to behold God in all of his radiant splendor. There's no doubt about it. But as soon as Adam was willing to listen to the lies of the powers of darkness, as soon as he was willing to listen to the angel of darkness, who we call Satan and Lucifer and the devil, Suddenly, he became imprisoned to a realm that he could no longer behold God's glory. He had to hide and um, run away in fear and shame. And there's too many people today running and hiding away in fear and shame. Listen, the confession of our faith is not, I am a sinner. The confession of our faith is, I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to grab a hold of this thing tonight for you and help you understand that it is more than just a doctrinal idea. It's a manifest presence. Because, uh, look, if without the manifest presence, you know, you have no real proof that the fruits of God, the Holy Ghost, is there uh, living and abiding in your life. Because he's the one who produces it. And when he comes with his presence, his anointing, there has got to be a way in which you and I step out of the regiment of our own life and our actions and, and the way that we've been trained by our parents and the people around us. And we begin to move in a Holy Ghost realm where there's clothing tongues of fire and a rushing mighty wind, where there's a moving of the Spirit of God, where there's a liberty and a freedom to flow in this divine grace. Now I want you to look over with me quickly in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24. All right, turn, turn there quickly. Tell me when you're there. Everybody tell me when I'm there, there. Tell me when you're there. Just can I tell me when you're there. Is everybody there? Is someone not there? We look and we find out that through the new covenant, are you there? I want you to see it. I want you to behold it. In the new covenant, we discover that the Lord has recreated us in righteousness and true holiness. 
we, we've been recreated after his image. The new creation, when we were born of the Spirit, this is the new birth. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be begotten of God, born of God, born of the Word. This is what it means to be saved. I mean, when Paul said, define salvation in Titus 3, 6, he couldn't define it more radically. He said, you're saved by the washing of regeneration. There's nothing that can clean you up so well as regeneration. Because that means that you're completely regenerated. You're born again. You've got new genes. You've got a new genealogy. You're a new being, a new creation, a new creature. And, and of course, he had early, previously said to the Corinthians, if you are a new creature, if you're a new creation, you know, if you've been begotten of God, old things are passed away and everything is now new. And now, why, why is it? Why is it there, there is very few testimonies on the planet of people who are new, who are everything old is gone, and everything is now of God, and it's new, it's God-breathed, it's God's life, it's the very life and expression of Jesus. I mean, the Lord began to deal with me about the, one of the great needs of the church, to go and begin to preach to the church, receive the life of Christ, because it's religion. It's become nothing but religion. It's become nothing but antics and accolades. It's not the reality of the living presence of Almighty God living and walking in our lives. As Paul said, dwelling in us, not taking us by the hand as he did under the first covenant, but now walking in our lives, dwelling in us, walking through our feet, touching through our hands. It's radical. 2 Corinthians 6.16 is a radical declaration of being the very house of God, the living presence of an Almighty God. I mean, what happened in between here, you know? What happened is that you can see by Genesis chapter 6. Look at what God says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6. Tell me when you're there. Tell me when you're there. Genesis 6, 6. Tell me when you're there. I want you to get radical tonight. I want you to, get, I want you to sit up and say, things are changing in my life. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to stop falling out to the, the powers of darkness. I'm going to stop committing treason against the kingdom of God. People are all upset about treason against the United States of America. Well, fine, that's bad. But treason against the kingdom of God. It should be intolerable. Amen. Betraying Christ Jesus. Trampling underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. Outraging the Holy Ghost. Come on now. Think about this, dear people, with me. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 6, the Lord said, It grieved him in his heart that he had made man. What happened? It grieved him in his heart that he had made man. For the imagination of man's heart was only wicked continually. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Angels and demon spirits began to teach men an entirely different way. They taught them how to worship demons through idols. They taught them how to participate in the worship by drinking intoxicants and taking all manner of various different herbs and stimulants. They began to teach them the actions of immorality so that through the perversions of immorality, they could then engage in this demon activity and then be in, in that much more in, intertwined with the activity, the very feeling and emotion of the demon spirit to be taught even more bondage. That's what happened. It became so bad, literally, that you can read there in verse 4 that the angels, fallen angels, came and had relations with the daughters of men and created the Nephilim. The Nephilim, which means the fallen ones that, were con that had come to teach men to fall, to over, to capitulate men. People say, oh, it's just, uh, uh, just my desire. It's a demonic desire. He said, I don't blame it on the devil. It's the powers of darkness that taught us. Suddenly, there has to be a people who want to be delivered from the influence of the demonic, who want to be delivered from the influence of these angels of darkness who come to teach all kinds of crazy perversions and every kind of wickedness and every kind of sin, every kind of iniquity, every kind of lawlessness. Somehow, 
A person has got to come to a place where they want to be delivered from it. They don't want it anymore. And, you know, then that's, turn with me to Luke chapter 1 and verse 75. And that's the kind of people that we see there in the day of Zechariah. Tell me when you're there. Is everybody there? If the foundation is destroyed, what should the righteous do? People run around with the ploy of Satan in their mouth saying, I am a sinner. That is anti-faith. That is anti-Christ. That is anti-word of God. The scripture tells us that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that we would be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Everybody quotes this fundamental foundational verse of Scripture that is a keystone to the confession of faith. But yet, continually, through satanic ploys, people walk around, I'm a sinner, taking upon themselves an identity that they follow demon spirits, that they are under the reign and the power of the powers of darkness. You're supposed to be at war against sin, at war against the devil. And there's no light, as it seems, a very little. <laughs> the Lord pointed out to me today in 1 Kings 2 Kings chapter 17, he was pointing out, don't turn there. He just pointed out to me today how that they feared the Lord and served their idols. Huh? Because it was after, it was after King Sennacherib, which is a perfect type of antichrist, when you understand it. I'm actually writing a book right now on the rise of the seventh and the eighth kingdoms. But when you understand it, Sennacherib was a perfect type of the antichrist. He was a descendant of Nimrod, right in the same line of the one who led the rebellion which most of Greek mythology is actually coined after. And it's not a bunch of hoopla nonsense. It's just a, it's, it's exaggerations because the angels, the gods, came down and produced sons of the gods, which we call the Nephilim, which the Bible calls the Nephilim, which is over and again talked about. David dealt with them. Uh, uh, Goliath, for example, stood somewhere between nine foot, one inch tall and ten foot six inches depending on how you define a cubit ah king of Bashan and Bashan being known as the land of the Nephilim and the Raphim which are two different ways to say the same thing the sons of Anak or the Anakim he st his bed was 15 foot long at the very least <laughs> David talked about one of these Nephilim who had six hands, uh, six fingers on both hands and six toes on both feet. He, when he, he weighed out for us uh, just a coat of mail upon Goliath, that, that giant, that Nephilim, who stood 9.1 to 10.6 feet high, weighing about somewhere between 126 pounds and 137 pounds, depending on how you weigh out the measure of a shekel. These are real, real events that really took place. And they had real supernatural power. And they're the ones who set up the idols. And they're the ones who taught men how to bow down to idols so that they could enter into a realm of demonic worship. They're the ones who taught sorcery and all kinds of magic and associated with it, which you had to become intoxicated. Because until you became intoxicated, you could not, you could not hear what the demon was saying. You could not sense what he was saying. You were, your, your, your very expression of your being and your emotions were cut off from the demon activity. It's not so, probably now you could have, what they could say back then, I'm sure they cannot say now, because with every generation, men have become more like the demon spirits and more like fallen angels. Satan's at work on someone who has created the image and the likeness of God in purity and holiness, in the divine glory, who through listening to the lie of Satan became, came into a prison. Here we see, a man who understood all of this, his name was Zechariah. He was a priest. He's the father of John the Baptist. You tell me Zechariah wasn't radical. I'm telling you, you show me a radical dad and I'll show you a radical son. You show me a sold out dad and I'll show you a sold out son. <laughs> and, and John the Baptist was radical. He wasn't diddle dallying around. He wasn't mixing it up with the world. 
Yes, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, but he was separate from sinners. There was absolutely no mingling of relationship whatsoever. No mingling of commonality whatsoever. There's a separate he was a separate from sinners as holiness is from demonic power, from the Holy Ghost is from evil spirits. And you and I are supposed to be that separate too because that's what sanctification means. That's what consecration means. We don't have a light of it. And so now we live in an age and we live in a time as we are approaching, quickly approaching the ultimate collapse of society. People said, ah, you know, I don't like these doom, doomsday guys, all oh, this doom and gloom. Listen, Ezekiel tells us very plainly that during the battle of Armageddon that they will be utilizing wooden shields and wooden bucklers and they will be utilizing arrows and bows and spears and then emphasizes that they will not need to go cut wood from the forest for seven years because there will be plenty of fuel for fire to burn just from the weaponry. People think things are going to continue on as they are, and it's just going to get better. No, look at the end point, then interpolate. I know what's going to happen, in other words, between a point I'm at right now and the time that the Antichrist comes on the scene. That is the total collapse of society. People think we're moving on towards intergalactic travel, and that we're going to be able to clone human beings, and we're going to have all these crazy, fantastic, Fantastical ideas. Ain't going to happen. Father's going to intervene, intervene just like he did in the days of Nimrod, who is the most perfect type of the Antichrist. You can understand more about the Antichrist through Nimrod than any other person. I mean, I, you know, here we are. Once again, I'm watching people make the same mistakes as they made in every generation, you know. You know, it was Hitler, then it was Russia. And who is ever enemy, that's the Antichrist, right? Now it's Islam. No, it's not Islam. Nimr Islam was not around in the days of Nimrod. It is right back to the same cult, the same iniquity, the same influence of demon spirits and fallen angels. <laughs> The same forms of idolatry, the same forms of immorality and iniquity that demon spirits have come to teach men so that there is no image of God left. So there is no purity left. So there is no holiness left. So there is no life of God left. It's everything other than that. It's everything immoral. We're people whose eyes are full of iniquity and they cannot cease from sin. Full of lust and immorality. Full of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And then the church goes along and backs that up and says, and intimidates and even bullies people, saying, you got to say that you're a sinner, otherwise somehow you're not confessing the, 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 the correct confession of faith. When we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, when we've been born of the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit, to walk in the holiness of the spirit of the living God. My God, what's wrong with us? Why can we be so deceived? How can we be so deceived? There's a people somewhere going to have to wake up and recognize that God has delivered us from the prison of torment and sin and the, all the power of darkness so that we no longer live our own lives subject to the things that belong to this world or subject to the prince and the power of the air. But under the authority of a living God being trained and, and brought up by Him and taught all the ways of righteousness, brought all the way back to that glory that He gave us when He shaped us in His own image in his own likeness. Jesus said, I've given them the glory back. I've given them the glory back. John chapter 17, verses 21, 23. I gave them the glory back. I gave them the same glory that you gave to me. One untainted. <laughs> Nicodemus, a righteous man. Nicodemus, a man who was devoted to the kingdom of God and the ways of God, who would have never, would have never participated in the stuff that modern-day Christians participate in. In fact, modern-day Christians... Uh, well, Christians 70 years ago wouldn't participate in the things that go on in modern day's Christian's life. There was an uproar among the secular community 70 years ago about a movie that was produced in Hollywood. Why? Because it had one bad word in it. Damn. 
And the secular community said, that's not, that, is, uh, that is wrong to be placing before our children. And here I even have the liberty, as it were, to say such a word in church now. Because, my, my goodness, that's, that's like innocence. Think about it. The movie was Gone with the Wind. Iniquity, sin, the perversion of it that makes the heart calloused and hard to where people sit down and, and, are, are, and interact and are involved with all kinds of pollution created right out of a demonic realm and then try to go where I'm talking about tonight. Impossible. Can't do it. You can't come in. There's lots of things that's wrong. You've got to stay out. But I'm not going to I'm not going to have it. I'm going to scream and holler at you. Get in. And then you're going to stand there all frustrated. Well, what do I got to do? Repent. Because if there's ever a time that people need to repent, we need to go preach repentance instead of just salvation is now. Huh? It's repentance that works salvation. Amen. Hallelujah. It's to decide. It's to decide like, look, it's to, it's to decide just like Zechariah did who said, Verse 7, he's worshiping God, and he's saying, praise God, verse 72, because God has performed the mercies that he promised to our fathers. He has remembered his holy covenant, verse 73, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, verse 74, that he would grant unto us being delivered out of the hand of our enemies so that we may without fear serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. I mean, how many people in church, when they give their life to God, are shouting, we get to now no longer have to live under sin. We get to walk with God in righteousness and holiness. We've been delivered out of the hand of our enemies. I mean, think about it. We got a different definition of salvation than the one that Jesus preached to the woman at the well. He said, you drink of this water, you'll never thirst for the world again. We, we go on and say, drink of this water and you can drink as much of the world too because God, God understands grace has made provision. Sin is no longer sin. That is, a, that is a demonic lie born right out of the pit of hell to enslave men into a place of deception where they can never be saved. And anybody can find out for themselves. All they got to do is get as serious about the Bible as they do their history book when they're about ready to have a final. Huh? And they want to make a good grade. Or their math book. Or whatever book. <laughs> and then it's got to be take another level of seriousness. <laughs> a seriousness about having what you read. Instead of thinking you're okay because you read it and you know it and you understand it. No, oh God. I mean, when, when fathers come, fathers come to every single person. The goodness of God, the grace of God has appeared to every man to show us these things, to teach us to deny worldly lust, to deny godliness, ungodliness, and to live righteously and soberly and godly right now. The Spirit of grace has appeared in showing men how beautiful and how wonderful and how glorious it is to be privileged to come and stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God in his mercy redeemed these demons back. So I said, you think God can redeem a, a fallen angel? He redeemed you. Are uh, you listening to me? Uh, not, after Father's done with us, my goodness gracious. He can, come on. I, have, I determine in my heart, praise God, I get to be on Father's side now. I get to now be taught the ways of righteousness and holiness. Uh, you're not going to hear me confessing ever that I'm a sinner. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I've been given the armor of righteousness. I have the confession of righteousness to walk in the fruits of righteousness by the spirit of righteousness. I just quoted, a, I just quoted six verses of Scripture. That wasn't my own ideas. Now, somebody comes on the radio and starts saying, you a sinner. You got to sin more or less every day. God knows that and understands why we have to sin because of the influence of sin. And you're going, amen, 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 amen. And that's not in the Bible at all. But that's the level of deception that we under. People are always thinking that the days of deception and the perilous times are going to be in the future. Behold, they're here right now. And watch out, because you're probably under the influence of it. If you're not walking in the Spirit, if you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost, that is the only place of truth. That's the only place of protection. <laughs> 
We cry out to God and we say, Father, shine your, every day, shine your floodlight of heaven upon our souls. We want nothing to do with sin and iniquity. We only want you. We, oh God, deliver us from evil. Oh God, do not lead us into temptation. Oh Father God, we want no interaction with angels of darkness or demon spirits. We're sold out to you. We come to you for your protection because we're desperate about it. Why? Because I already see myself at that crisis moment when I breathe out my last breath and the claim and the contest of whether I spend eternity in hell or I spend eternity in the presence of the living God plays out before me right now. I'm not living like a fool with my head buried in the sand. I can see into the future. I understand the reality of that day because God gave me wisdom. I once was a fool. And God breathed into me the spirit of wisdom so that I could see. Now I'm praying in Jesus' name that you will allow God, the Holy Ghost, to breathe into you the spirit of wisdom and understanding and the knowledge of the Lord so that you don't live your life foolishly, not preparing, but just living as though you're going to face no judgment. I mean, you know what? Yeah, the scripture says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. You know what else I call a fool? A fool is a person that lives like they're not going to stand before a living God too. That's a fool. As much as a fool has said in his heart there is no God. Because as far as I'm concerned, it's the same atheistic spirit. It's the same atheistic spirit. It's just dressed up a little prettier. Huh? Huh? Are you listening to me? You're going to have to decide whether or not, turn this up. You're going to have to decide whether or not you're going to allow the fear of the Lord to be in your life. Whether or not you're going to allow the reality of the presence of Jesus to rule your life. Whether or not the Holy Ghost who's come to teach us and lead us into all truth, which is God's righteousness and holiness, by the way. All truth is God's ways. He's come to lead us into all God's ways. You're going to have to decide how valuable that is to you, how much you're willing to sell out everything that all the other alternatives. For me, I was bought with a price. I'm not my own. I'm given over to glorifying God in my body and in my spirit. I'm not a thief. In other words, God bought me. I'm not going to go steal from him and take me back. Huh? Stevery. I'm not a liar. I'm not going to say I'm in covenant with God and continually commit the acts of treason and betrayal. I'm going to walk in truth. If I slip up and sin and fall into something that is not right, I'm going to cry out desperately, Oh, God, forgive me. I'm going to set my heart and fix my heart on it never happening again. Somebody said, Are you perfect? No, but I want to be. And there's a big difference from saying, no, I'm not perfect without a commitment to wanting to be because God told us to be perfect even as our Father in heaven is perfect. When God gave Abraham the covenant and commanded him to walk with him, he said, Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. And nobody can work. There's no workaround for that, people. Many bright folks have tried already. There's no workaround. It is what it is. The Lord has invited us in to living by the Spirit, and the Holy Ghost doesn't make mistakes. The Holy Spirit cannot be overcome by any powers of darkness. He's far far mightier than Michael the archangel. (laughs) The Holy Ghost is God. (laughs) And when God himself is, is in you and you in him, and he has control of you. And boy, what a wonderful place of safety and security it is to know that I'm kept by the power of God because there's no power greater than his power. If you could possibly take the high ends out, it would bless everybody's ears. And I don't mind. I understand that you're captivated by what I'm saying. Not rather you be captivated by the word of God. Grab a hold of the word of truth. Be consecrated and committed to it. Instead of diddle-dallying around. Because you're not going to diddle-dally around too long. And Satan's going to take you out one way or the other. He's either going to get such a stronghold on your spirit. And such a stronghold on your emotions and your appetites. That you can never break free from sin. Or you'll ultimately come to a place where you justify it and you don't care. I can tell you tonight. 
that there's no one here who's blasphemed the Holy Ghost. There's no one here that's committed the unpardonable sin. Every one of you are here tonight because God has brought you here to teach you the ways of righteousness, but he's not going to force you. You've got to be willing to want this more than anything else. This has to be a pearl, a great price for which you're willing to sell everything to have it. This has to be a treasure in a field which nothing can compare. You're willing to take everything that you have and everything that you are and everything you could possibly get and, and get, turn it over. Huh? People want to be able to have things right in their house, and yet they don't want to walk in the divine principles. I'm going to tell you one thing for sure. I'm going to tell you one thing that great, has, has great dividends in God. You listen to me. The Father is always looking and searching and seeking. I'm going to read this verse of Scripture here in Psalms 11. But there are people all the time that prioritize the kingdom of God. They don't keep the kingdom of God first. I walk before the Lord perfect in, certain, in the terms of keeping the kingdom of God first. My heart was perfect. I never deprioritized God. It did not matter what was going on. I never sat back and somehow justified, well, I'm not going to go to the meeting. Because after all, I got to do this and I got to do that. And I got this thing going on, that thing going on. I consecrated myself keeping Father and his things first. My heart's perfect before the Lord. And I believe that it is fundamental to every person's life. And if you compromise that, you violate spiritual laws, it's going to get your whole house in trouble. It's going to get your whole house in trouble. Oh, people want to be able to violate laws in God and have no consequence. Meanwhile, when they see a police, they're all getting in a panic. Oh, there's a popo. Slow down, act right. The fear of man's in the heart. The fear, does, the fear that police car's in the heart. Where's the fear of the Lord? Where's the fear of the living God? Where's the honor and the reverence for the things of his house and the things of his ministry? I'm going to tell you right now, you, when you love the anointing, you love everyone who's anointed. When you honor the anointing, you honor everyone that is anointed. <laughs> when you have reverence for the anointing of God, you reverence everyone that is anointed. Even if the person is Saul, you learn that you don't touch God's man for nothing. A lot of people today live in anarchy. I mean, we used to, we lived in a time of where we question authority. We went from a place of submission to authority in the, in the culture of the United States of America, among God's, young, uh, among God's people, and just among secular people. There was honor for mom and dad. So there was a, not a place of submission to authority. Then we went to question authority. You know where we're at right now? We're at despise authority. Look around. You can find it on every level, and especially in the church. And that's why us being the hinderer of iniquity or the hinderer of lawlessness, we have capitulated, and thus a flood has, has, has overwhelmed humanity so that they despise the authority of the president, despise the authority of Congress and of the Senate and of the Supreme Court and of the judicial system and of the law and every area of life. And what's next? Anarchy to overthrow it. It's called the rebellion. It's called apostasy to overthrow it. The United States of America right now is on the brink of anarchy. It is on the brink. We have watched it. We've heard the prophets prophesy over it. Besides that, we know where the end point is. But I, I remember when I was little and the prophets that are dead now, men of God, they're holy men of God, would have never been involved in the stuff that I've been involved in. Would have never allowed in their house things that I've allowed in my house. And I've not allowed half the stuff that everybody else has. Are you listening to me? A tenth of it. A fraction of it. Holy men have gone. People admire Wigglesworth. He would not touch a book that wasn't the Bible. Contaminate him. That's what he believed. He wouldn't read a newspaper. It was profane. All it was was a ministry of evil spirits. So he said, ah, oh, man, that guy's weird. He, could, he had authority over devils, didn't he? Just crank it, man. Crank it up. He had authority over devils. He raised, you know, more than 18 people from the dead. 
He poked fun at him and say he was overboard and legalist, whatever you want. If anybody wanted to say he was legalist, it would have been Wigglesworth. You can call him legalist. Huh? But he wasn't a legalist. He was a holy man of God. He was lived in a realm called sanctification. A doctrine is very... You're not going to hear these hyper-grace people to say everything's good and it's all fine, I ought to talk about sanctification. They don't know nothing about it. It's a message they know nothing of and they can never preach it. Are you with me? We, in a, we, in a, we are watching the rise of the apostate church. The Lord showed me a number of years ago that the apostate church would rise in, alongside of and parallel to the glorious church. I used to think they were sequential. I used to think first that there would be the rise of the glorious church, the one that Jesus is coming for that has no spot or wrinkle, the one is the precious fruit of the earth that the husbandman hath long patience for that you read about in James chapter 5. You with me? You know, I'm quoting Scripture. Sometimes people don't know I'm quoting Scripture. You know, glorious church without spot or wrinkle, Ephesians chapter 5. Are you with me? Everybody know I'm quoting Scripture? I just want to make sure. Because we're so used to just hearing what everybody's got to say off the top of their head and just think it's another opinion. Look, it's one thing for man's opinion, but God's opinion is altogether a different thing. And God is, God's opinions are thoroughly expressed and clearly expressed to us in his word. And we need to make sure that we're making the difference. I'm telling you, forgive me if I haven't pointed out to you enough the verses of Scripture and the word of God. God's opinion, what he demands of our life. The only thing that's going to work. Nothing else is going to work. Satan designed society. He designed it. The social system, the governments, they by and large are designed by Satan. Now, I understand in Romans chapter 13, considering the laws, that God's placed people in authority with, with respect to laws. That's different. I'm talking about something different there. But when it comes to society and the measure of society and its influence, the humanism, the Antichrist, God-denying impacts of government, the wars, and all these other illicit things. That's what I'm talking about. Satan designed it. You can read in the Bible and you can discover that Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10 is the first one to create a kingdom. And he created the kingdom of Bel, who was his dad, Cush. And the kingdom became, and, and Bel and his consort are demon spirits to still function in this world today. And you can see their influence. And we're going to see the rise of it again in the seventh and the eighth kingdom. You read about it in the book of Revelation. It's not Islam. It's the same angels of darkness. And people ought to be able to see it because Satan steps right out onto the scene in Revelation chapter 12. We'll, we'll, do, we'll be doing a book of Revelation study, in fact, a week from this Friday. We we'll hope you come. And I've been doing it because I started doing it because I'm li listening to all this nonsense. People talking a bunch of nonsense about the book of Revelation, making it, you know, fantastical. Look, it's time for you and I to wake up. I mean, all you got to do is begin to cry out to God, get on your face. I mean, I'm so blessed, so blessed by how hard everyone worked. For I am remnant, but I'm not going to sit around and play patty cat, patty cake. Let's 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 fake a remnant deal. If you remnant, that's a that is a radical, that is a radical standard to live up to. Because number one, remnant's rejected and despised and doesn't fit in. It's a piece of cloth that had no use. It was thrown away. It's it's not valued. It's meaningless. They wandered in dens and caves of whom this world was not worthy. You can read about them in Hebrews chapter 11. <laughs> There's not anyone I ever saw as remnant that was accepted or popular or fit into nothing that was going on in this world. But they shined as lights and they subdued kingdoms and wrought righteousness and changed generations. Come on. They lifted up the standard. They called God's people back to repentance. They were revivalists. They were judges, champions, those whom God raised up with great anointings to throw off the afflictions of their enemies. And I pray that you want to be that. I pray that you want to be a remnant. And I pray that you understand you cannot capitulate and give place to the lust of flesh and lust of the eye and pride of life and think that you're going to throw off the powers of darkness that had deceived a generation? 
You're going to have to be willing to come out from among them and be ye separate, because that's what remnant is. Come out from among them, be ye separate, says the Lord. Is that in the New Testament or the Old Testament? New Testament. There's, people, there's a lot of people who think that that's in the Old Testament. You just start saying, hey, the Lord says, come out from among them, be ye separate, says the Lord. Oh, quit co- quoting the Old Testament. He just like, what a laugh. It is in the Old Testament. That's your problem. You have not divided the old from the new. You don't even know what the new is about. You say you're living in the new covenant, but you have, you're holding on to a nature that's an old covenant one. Huh? Instead of grabbing a hold of a new covenant nature. <laughs> Where God comes, lives, and dwells on the inside of you. And you are an evident, glowing, Holy Ghost tabernacle of His presence. So that there would be a tabernacle of witness. You didn't have to look at the children of Israel and go, hmm, I wonder if there's a cloud around them. I wonder if God's presence is in their midst. It was a pillar of fire by night. That's what it means to tabernacle. <laughs> Hallelujah. And God made us tabernacles of his glory. Man, I'm telling you right now, you need to sit under this anointing and under this word for the rest of your life. People coming and going, restless spirits. You need to get built up in the faith and know how to stand something because God gives you a lifetime to stand. I don't know how long your lifetime is, but God gives you a lifetime to be willing to stand for him. To be willing to be sealed by the spirit of the living God where Satan comes and has nothing in you. People are going to have to understand that sanctification is as important as salvation. And everybody up until the modern time preached it so. Everyone. Everyone until the modern time. But guess what's going on in the modern time? Perilous days, seducing spirits. The time of great deception. The time of apostasy. It's not just question authority. It's not despise, just despise authority. It's to defy it, to overthrow it. We're just crying out for, I'm crying out, and I want you to cry out with me. You know, I mean, I'm telling you, I was just so blessed because, you know, uh, I recently met Pat. I I didn't know Pat until, like, I think it was July 15th or something that we met him, and we met him and Karen, his wife, and we we were just immediately, you know, we were just immediately friends, immediately felt like we've known each other. That's that's the way walking in the light is. You have fellowship one with another. It's like, it's just there. You don't have to make it. You don't have to work at it. It's just there. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, I'm telling you, this church just like blew him away. You guys blew him away. And you blew him away because he has to deal with a church that really doesn't even know where to begin. It's either crazy flaky or it's just cold and there's hardly any life and movement and responsiveness. And, you know, and I would, I'm just so blessed by that. And, you know, you don't, you don't, you know, you can, you can basically think, well, hey, he's just up there and he's displeased with all of us and he's calling us to this radical place. Or you can understand, wait a minute, there's a whole lot more. Because even Pat was standing on the platform on Sunday night going, my God, I just had a, I've just had a vision like I've never had. I did not know there was even this realm. There is so much more. Come on, I don't care who they are, anybody anyone who's hungry for the things of the Spirit and knows how to begin to step over in the realm's anointing, what's going to happen is stepping over in the realm's anointing is going to cause you to step deeper and step deeper and cooperate more and participate more and with obedience and it becomes more understanding. You get to see more. Amen. Just like Pop Seymour, you know. You get to see more. Amen. Hallelujah. Pop Seymour got to see more and it wasn't because he didn't go through a lot of stuff. He went through a lot of things, you know, and he didn't let it mess with him. He didn't mess with his hunger. It didn't mess with his passion. He didn't mess with his pursuit for the Lord. What messes with your hunger and what messes with your passion and what messes with your pursuit for the Lord? You're going to have to be willing to let the Holy Ghost provoke you unto good works. You're going to have to be willing to come and be pressed into a place where you say, look, I'm going to define this thing tonight in my life. I'm going to lay hold of God. I'm going to understand what it means. Listen, when the Lord begins to move on your life, and I saw a number of you, well, I saw everybody really allowing the Lord to touch you, allowing the Lord to move in your, 
in your life, even though some of you, my goodness, were worn slap out because you worked so hard setting all that up. And, you know, once again, we're, we're so thankful. We're so thankful. We're so thankful for your sacrifice, for your love, for your commitment. You know, but I was watching as some of you, as you were just receiving from the Lord, you were just stepping over into a greater realm of consecration to the Lord. Understand, if you don't make a move now, immediately, you'll get right back in the same ditch you were in before. If you don't make a move, if you don't change things now, if you don't do it differently now, you'll find yourself back in the same state, just not knowing how to move forward, not feeling it. Huh? Don't go kissing on another person. You know what I'm saying? You're in a relationship with the Lord. Don't go kissing on the world. Don't go into, because the Lord actually called it adultery, spiritual adultery. When your heart is set on an affection of one love, this one love, this one relationship, that holy relationship, that bond, and you have eyes for no one else. You have affections for no one else, and you won't allow yourself to go there. That affection grows. That love becomes so loyal. It becomes so loyal. Hallelujah. What a wonderful realm to be so in, he's so in love with us that he's loyal to us. Oh, when we begin to no longer kiss on the world, no longer hug on the world, no longer hang out with his enemies, no longer allow ourselves to interact with demon spirits just because we're stupid. Stupid means you don't understand. Stupid means you don't get it. Stupid means you've been told 50 times and you still don't get it. Are you with me? Huh? That you don't realize that what you're doing is actually interacting with the demon spirit with that attitude. Come on, man. Where do you think man learned it? Huh? Did it just poof? Just magically? It was just all this demonic stuff was just automatically on the inside of man? No, they're taught by devils. Taught by demon spirits. That's why, that's why, that's why John says in John, 1 John 3, 7, he that sins is of the devil. Because you cannot interact with sin without the activity of a demon spirit. I mean, John, you'd read first epistle, John. I challenge anybody, you listen to me, whether you're here tonight or you're listening on the web. I've, cha I've challenged preachers with this, and it's changed their lives. I've challenged laymen with, layman with this, and it's changed their life. I challenge you to know other, no other part of the Bible but first John. Just read the first epistle of John just for like, you know, three, four months. All you know about God and what God wants you to do is the first epistle of John. It will change your life. Three months. Read it every day. You know how quickly you can read 1 John? The epistle of 1 John. You know how quickly you can read that? Less than 30 minutes. And that's if you're like a, you know, took Elmer Thud's sped reading course. You know what I'm saying? You can do it quickly. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Uh, and then what happens is if you start slowing down a little bit with it. And I guarantee you the Holy Ghost is going to slow you down because you're going to go, What? What? We know that everyone who is born of God does not sin. What? Back up. Rewind. What? 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 Huh? What is that saying? Is that bringing into question my salvation? Is it? It doesn't bring into question my salvation. Huh? It's 1 John 5, 18. We know that whosoever is born of God does not sin. But he keeps himself, and the wicked one cannot touch him. Now, just think about that. Please, because there's a big part of us keeping ourselves and saying, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not walking that way. I'm not living like that. I'm not engaging in that nonsense. Huh? Come on, people. God has given us a will and given you a will that's stronger than many people even realize. Except for we can really find out when how powerful your will is. When it becomes something you really want to do. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. The solid side, suddenly the wheel emerges strong and alive. How about, how about us just selling out to say, take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine, 
Look, it's a vow to God. When you sing that song, I can I can feel it when people are lip singing that song. Man, I'll just stop singing it. It's got to be at right time. You know, it's got to be right at the altar call when everybody's ready to say, yes, truly, I mean this. And it's not just hearing my voice and I'm singing along because I want to participate. But it's like, it's like two from the heart. Take my will, Father, and make it thine. It shall not be no longer mine. Take my heart. It is thine own. It shall be your royal throne. A preacher's daughter wrote that in 1860. They had something different going on. Now all people say, my heart is wicked and deceitful. And blah, blah, blah. Where'd you get that from? Because that's not Jeremiah 17, 6. Where'd you get that from? Because people would rather have that image and rather have that identity. They would rather be able to say, I am a sinner. And, and, and then to say, I am a righteous. I am one of the righteous ones. Ooh. Ouch. Lord, help us. Let me read this to you in Psalms 11. It's a getting to be real late. I know you guys are all tired and worn out. That's why I didn't do a school of the spirit this week. Because I just want everybody to be able to rest up. Because I know you, I know it, it, you, I know you guys worked hard, and it takes a lot to do these conferences. It's a lot of sacrifice. It's a, it's a it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort, but good things come out of it. Somebody said, "Well, a lot of people didn't come. You came, <laughs> and that was really what God. That was what Father was interested in. Amen." We had a visitor tonight. They didn't even make it through the first part of the song service before we even got warmed up. It's just sad to me. I mean, people are going to have to get around. You're going to have to open up your eyes and get with people that way. We see them walk out. I can't forsake the microphone and go walk out with them and talk to them. And Pauline is not here anymore. Hello. Get your heart set on souls. Get out of your insecurity or whatever it is. Open up your eyes. Don't live your own life. Live his life. Come on now. I mean, I could lay the microphone down and follow her out, but I don't know what's going to happen while I'm gone. Everybody's going to, you know what's going to happen? Everybody's going to look around. Where'd he go? Maybe I should do that. Maybe I could really emphasize the point of how to watch for people. Take I mean, come on, what, what does it mean to reach the lost? What does it mean to have a compassion for the lost? <laughs> you can see it, it's on you, it's there every day. It's in the way you move, it's in the way you act, it's in the way you do things. If you don't have it, ask God to give it to you, do it. But ask Him in sincerity and truth because He's not going to answer with anything else. Can You know what? That's what He says. He says, you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you're asking amiss. You're not serious about it. Huh? Or you're asking a fantasy so you can consume it in your own lust. Or it's about your own desires. Huh? That's what James said. Well, was he a preacher or what? Was James a preacher or what? James was a radical preacher. Jude, clouds without water. Twice plucked up by the roots. You can't transplant a tree twice. You know what I'm saying? It ain't going to work out. Twice plucked up by the roots. You start preaching like that, people, t because we moved from submission to authority to question authority to despising authority, people just despise you. I'm happy to be despised. I have no problem with it because I'm honored. I don't seek, his, I don't seek anybody's honor but his honor. I don't care. I only want his honor. So long as I know I'm, I have his honor, I'm speaking his word just like he told me to say it. I'm declaring it the way it has to be declared in order to break through the nonsense to break through the interference, I got his honor. I, you need to be willing to do the same. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to do the will. All you're going to do is you're going to people please. You're going to be Laodicean. You're going to people please. You're going to try to facilitate whatever the person is feeling or thinking. You're going to try to get along. You're going to try to integrate. You're going to try to accommodate. You're going to try to compromise. How many of you really realize that compromise is demonic? It truly is. Satan is constantly trying to get us com to compromise. He uses very subtle tactic tactics to get us to compromise with things that seemingly are harmless to ultimately bring us into a full-fledged compromise 
than where he's got us. It's demonic because what God does is agreement. It's agreement. There is no compromise. Father will not compromise a single thing. He's calling you and I to come into agreement with him. Understand, if you despise authority anywhere, you despise God. Because it's the way that the enemy works it. And he, he's got you now questioning authority in places where, you know, supposedly it's okay to do it. <laughs> but what happens is a spiritual condition. So it begins to be a landslide or a domino effect in every dimension of your life. To where that ultimately then it will always lead to despising authority which will always inevitably lead to defying authority. And then that's where people just get up and walk out. And I don't have to listen to that. And I don't agree with him. And who does he think he is after all, you know? And you don't realize you're exalting yourself doing that. It's self-exaltation. Huh? So, yeah, you know, on, uh, on Sunday night, I just told people, I said, squeeze together, squeeze together, squeeze tighter. And reason being is, because if God's people can understand how to get that connected, if God's people can become, uh, come to understand how to be that close, that transparent, that dependent, I'm going to tell you right now, if, if you love me, you would never allow anything in your thinking or the framework of your thinking that would, would in any way violate that which would cause me not to to walk in righteousness and holiness. If you love people, a guy would never do anything with a girl that would cause her standing before the Lord to be compromised. It would cause her to fall into something that would jeopardize her soul. If a, man, if a woman loves a man the same way, it's very, love is very protective. Hello. All the rest of it is nonsense. It's a lie. It's a deceptive lie. It's a humanistic deceptive lie. It's, it's the love-hate thing, right? Love you today, hate you tomorrow. It's all a lie. God shows us what real love is. It's everlasting love. It's unchanging love. And I'm so glad I'm on his side. I'm so glad I'm with him. I don't have to wonder what he's going to be like next year. I know exactly what he's going to be like. He doesn't change. What a blessing, eh? Amen? What a blessing. He's righteous and he's, ju and he's just. He's not going to say, you know what? I don't like you. Mark, I don't like you. You just don't look right to me. I don't like you. But, you know, I like J.J. He looks right. Fathers, he's not, he, doesn't have, he doesn't have any kind of partialities. He's no respecter of person. He didn't say, oh, well, you know what? It's okay. You can get away with it. You're so sweet. No worries. You, you're ornery. You know what? I'm making you live by the whole you know, length of every command. He is, his father's not that way. He hates that kind of diverse weights and measurements. He will judge you just like he judged Jesus. He'll judge me just like he judged Jesus, judge, judged Jesus. If you do what Sodom and Gomorrah did, you will have the same damnation. If I tell you right now, if you do what Chorazan and Bethsaida did and Capernaum did, you'll have the same damnation. And they were all walking around acting like that they were the people of God. And going, this, going to the church and praying, crying out to God, Oh, Lord, send the Messiah, while the Messiah was right in front of them. Because they didn't really honor God. If they would have honored him, then they would have recognized Jesus and honored Jesus. Nicodemus really honored God, so he knew. Joseph of Arimathea really honored God, so he knew. He knew. The rest were just posers. They were just doing their religious thing. They're all high on themselves of what they knew, their position. People seeking position uh, among men. You better watch out. That is a very demonic thing. It will keep you from ever going in this realm I'm talking about because you need position. You need, a, you need people to give you, a, to recognize that you are someone or something. It's demonic. They keep you from the realms of heaven. Because there, the Lord says, you, if, you, if you seek honor of men, there's no righteousness in you. There's no, there's no truth in you. I mean, think about Jesus in that big message. I mean, calling them, the, the, telling them that their father is the devil. I mean, how, you know what? That's pretty radical. Let me tell you guys, 
You all dressed up in your religious garments. You all think you're so righteous and holy and everything and that you seek God. Well, let me just tell you right now. Listen, your father's the devil. It's hard to smile when somebody's telling you that one. Hey, it's hard to feel good about the guy. Well, man, if you could have just said it in another way, you know. More accommodating way, more receptive, you know, easy, more easy to way receive. Didn't he read the proverb, you know, uh, rightly spoken words are like apples of gold and settings of silver. Didn't he hear about that? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. If you do not eat my flesh, he could have said it in many different ways. He said it in the right way. He wanted to challenge whether or not they were hungry and thirsty and passionate and real and true and could see beyond just flattery. You with me? could see beyond that which accommodated them, that which satisfied them, that which made sense to them. Huh? Father, come try me. It's what you want. And I'm going to tell you right now what you want. I'll tell you what you want. I'm, I grab a hold of this. Oh, God, lead me not into to, to temptation. Deliver me from evil. I'm telling you, I'm, listen, I think that's one of the secrets to my walk with the Lord. I'm crying out, oh, God, I don't want to be led into any temptation. You know. Isn't it nice to th think that that's a possibility? Well, Jesus, if Jesus sweat and said to pray that way, I would have been able to tell you that there's a possibility. No temptation. Don't lead me into any temptation, Papa. Deliver me from the evil. I want nothing to do with demon spirits. I want nothing to do with sin and iniquity. I want nothing to do with angels of darkness. I want nothing to do with hell. I want nothing to do with the lust of the flesh of God. That's something to get passionate about. That's more important than your bills. Hallelujah. For your food, your clothing. Whether or not you have any friends or anybody likes you or what. Oh, God, give me a friend. Sikata na niki kata. Mexiata pakiniela. It is a place where the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. It's a place where the Holy Ghost teaches us to how to submit on every level of our appetite and emotions to Him. It's a beautiful realm. It's not just some Pentecostal experience. It's not some gift, just some gift. It's an interaction. God, the Holy Ghost, training us to speak and think and feel and act correctly. It's a shock collar, too. Anybody here, Steve, talk about the shock collar. Oh, wouldn't it be great if you had a shock collar and I'd get ready to do something wrong? You get zapped with a shock collar. I have one. I have one. As soon as something's getting ready to go down... I have an intercession of the Holy Ghost that rise up in me. I can't do it right now. I can only just kind of give you a feel of it because it's a special tongue. It's a tongue that only simply is about the Lord strengthening me and building me up, saying, you're getting ready to, you're getting ready to step in it if you're not careful. You're getting ready to meet a challenge right now. You're getting ready to, you get a, you've got to turn away quickly. I didn't always have that. That got developed in my life. Huh? <laughs> that got matured in my life because I gave myself continually to the, these, uh, this activity of the Holy Ghost. And the more I give myself to the activity of the Holy Ghost, huh, the more I want to give myself to the activity of the Holy Ghost. It's not something like it's legalism or, you know, something, a religious act. It's, I get to, wow, this is really a good spot. I really did, we truly found, you know, there's a vein for the silver, you know. And once you hit the vein, you're like, well, wow, we're on it. Because the vein keeps getting thicker and wider. You're, doing, you're going, we are, gonna, we are rich. <laughs> so you just dig, the, you dig that much harder. There's a vein for the gold. Well, that's what we're talking about here. This realm in the Holy Ghost. It is a place where it is accompanied by the manifest presence of the Lord. The manifest presence of Jesus that is heavenly. It is supernatural. If you, if you don't know how to get there, if you're worn out and strained and feel still the same way same you know feel just like you do in any other activity you're not you're not on it there's some some slight 
adjustments that need to be made. And we're here to help you make those. But if you never ask, if you just sit there, if you spend 50 years doing the wrong thing. Have you, how many of you have ever, ever heard of doing the wrong thing wrong? That is the worst. Okay. I mean, the best is doing the right thing right. Huh? But even worse, even almost as bad as doing the wrong thing wrong is doing the wrong thing right. Huh? And, in, and just about as bad as that is doing the right thing wrong. And that's when you step over into praying, you're not doing it right. You're doing it wrong. You're doing the right thing. You're down, oh God, oh God, oh God. But you're in doubt and unbelief and you don't know how to step over into that realm of faith that brings showers of blessing, causes you to feel the rain of heaven. The glory of God fills your soul. The atmosphere changes, literally changes. This isn't pretend. I'm not make, believing, I'm making up words. I'm not exaggerating a state. I'm telling you, it's really heaven. It's really heaven. And if you don't have that, we want to show you how to have that. Because once you get in that realm, you can instantly have joy unspeakable and full of glory anytime you need it. You can instantly have the same love of the Father anytime you need it. You can step right into it. And, and, and on, 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 another, on another measure of expression. Because how many of you understand, when you got somebody putting the hate on you, and God's told you to love your enemies, to love those who hate you, to bless those who hate you, how many understand you need to step right immediately into a whole nother level of divine love being expressed through you, right? Where that you're not sitting there responding out of yourself in self-defense. I can't believe you feel this way about me. I am so offended. Hey, perfect, perfect peace. Have they who love your word, Lord, and nothing offends them. I know I can tell you real quickly the people who really love the word, they're never offended. Everybody else is growing in grace, hopefully. But you know how you're growing in grace? You know how you can know you're growing in grace? Because you can measure the growth. Are you with me? Huh? How about if you went up to the wall when you're a little guy and you had mom measure you, okay? You came back six months later and you were actually shorter. And then it going to help. Oh, I tell you what, it's going to even help. And instead of you're like, Barely, you're so, you've grown so little, you can't even tell the difference in the pencil marks. Just barely. You're depressed. You're depressed. You're like, you're worried. You're concerned. You're going, what's wrong with me? I'm not growing. I need to go to the doctor. I need to get some help. I'm not growing. Why doesn't that work in the spiritual realm? Why can't people see that which eyes cannot see when God has given us the ability? Why can't people hear what ears cannot hurt hear when God has given us the ability? Why is it that folks want to go ahead and just stay where they're, at, where they're at or slow growth? I mean, slow growth. I mean, don't even be contented with slow growth. Tell you what happens. Sin is deceitful. Iniquity is deceitful. It hardens the heart. It makes you uncaring. It makes you numb. Pain will make you numb. People who live with pain have had to live with pain long term. They become numb. Because it's the way you deal with it. It's become numb. That affliction and that dysfunction and that deep hurt not only makes you numb to that place where so people can't hurt you, it makes you numb to the Holy Ghost too. Deliverance is needed. Healing is needed. But you gotta, you got to be willing to say, I need. I need. Open mouth, say, I need. Because that's really God saying, God's what Father says, humble yourself. You want to walk around, I'm fine. No, you're not. Knock, knock, knock. You're not fine. And if it was something physical, you'd be at the doctor getting a full MRI. <laughs> What's wrong with me? I can't feel my hand. <laughs> you would be, man. You'd be, you'd be knocking down doors, right? You would. Medicare, Medicaid, I mean, whatever it takes. <laughs> Jesus. They're said they're far more important than your physical body. 
spiritual need, your spiritual life. People, you and I, we've got to be able to show the world around us a, a, a foundation where they can stand. We've got, we've got to show them a realm and an identity where that they can win. We've got to stop showing people an identity that looks like sin and the devil. Where can people stand there? There's no hope. There's no place to gain any ground. There's no headway that anyone can make. We're just all stuck. I'm, I'm here, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm not doing right, and I don't know how to do right, and I've failed, and I don't know how to, how to be successful. We've got to find a, we've got to be able to step into a realm that God has given us to be strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of His might, and this confession, hallelujah, to where your faith is effectual because you acknowledge every good thing that is in you. My faith works. My faith is powerful because I say God's in me, man. Watch out. Hallelujah. Because I said, the Holy Ghost, Father God, Christ Jesus dwells in me. I've been filled with all power. I'm strength. I mean, I have this glorious power. We're, we're at work on the inside of me. Now unto them is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can think or ask according to his power that is at work on the inside of us. And that is in the context of stepping into all of his fullness. To know the height, the breadth, the length, the depth. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, and there be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do seemingly abundantly above all that you can think or ask according to this power. Hallelujah. And by the way, that is, a, that is scripture. That is a, <laughs> that's the opinion of God. That's what Father said. That's what Paul discovered. Paul had it. God's no respecter of persons. What he gave to Paul, he gave to everyone. It's ours. You just got to start saying, it's mine. I no longer live. It's Christ who lives. Jesus in me. Look in your eyes and see the Holy Ghost. Wow. See the beauty of heaven. Hallelujah. Purustaya. Mambradeya. Kaladeya purustaya. Hallelujah. Malandehru. I laid hands on Pat. He said he zored up past the Milky Way. I mean, get up here, man. Get up here. Goodness, God's got something good for you, too. He'll give you a heavenly vision. I'm not kidding you. But you're going to have to understand there, there are certain transitions that got to go on in your life. There's attitude adjustments that can only be made because you're willing to cooperate with the God, the Holy Ghost. I know I'm strong. I know I'm intense. That's the way God made me. So I can do my job. Maybe God made you like my wife, she's sweet and she's a gentle, tender little thing. She's like, you know, huh? she's like the flower that, you know, as it's, it's, it's soon as, right? As soon as anything starts going bad, she just folds right up. Huh? If it gets one, you know, she folds right up. As soon as the light comes out, ah, oh, she's bad. You know, huh? she's just full bloom. That's her. If it's one temperature, one degree hotter than normal, she melts. That's good. God uses everybody, every and every place. And look, they, the Lord put us together. And, the, and she says she's having a good time. And I believe her. Psalms chapter 11. And what I'm saying is my wife can handle it, so can you. I mean, you can move past. You can move past. The things that on the outward that maybe bother you and understand that this in, and recognize the things of the spirit. Don't recognize me. Recognize the things of the spirit. Recognize the word of God. Recognize the call of God. That'd be, that, that'd be what you focus on. Not that I'm spitting <laughs> and screaming because I'm passionate. Hear the word of God calling you. Don't let Satan discourage you. So many people allow discouragement and condemnation. Condemnation is because you're not allowing peace to rule your heart and your mind. Peace deals with, deals with destroys condemnation. That's what peace is all about. There's no more offense. There's no more guilt. There's no more condemnation. He says, peace to those who are near and to those who are far off. Come sit down and have fellowship with me. Huh? Isn't that beautiful? God look at us and say, no more condemnation. Peace. Isn't that beautiful? Huh? You should never feel guilty. You should never feel ashamed. Hallelujah. Unless you commit acts of treason against the kingdom of God, then be real shamed. Waller on the ground for a while. I mean, whatever. Get, get hurt. 
or call me up, I'll come and kick you some. I mean, hurt. Hurt till it's so painful that you won't do it no more. I mean, I'm, you know what I'm saying. I'm not saying walk up a, a stair of glass, cut yourself. I'm just saying, you know, God the Holy Ghost is going to create godly sorrow. That's what I mean. Okay? God create godly sorrow. This is where you thought, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that to God anymore. Lord, I, want to do that. I don't want to do that to you, Lord Jesus. I don't want to, I don't want to pollute your name, profane your name. Let me just tell you something. Because I'm trying to relate something to you before I read this verse scripture. I wouldn't be involved with sin and iniquity because I don't want to hurt my wife. Because I love her. I love her deeply. I don't want to be involved in sin and iniquity to produce shame because I don't want to hurt my children. Because I know that it would destroy them and affect them. Are you, can you hear me? I mean, I can, isn't that wisdom to keep these kinds of things? Look at the consequences of sin, because we know the wages of sin is death. I don't care whether it, no one else can see it or not. It will work destruction. It is a great wisdom to have. It will destroy you. You will not get ahead. You will not make it. The only way you could make it is you got to deny God and renounce God. And, you know, come on. you got to just go into a realm of deception to make it, as it were. Because when, you, when you've been willing to cry out to God and give yourself over to Him, good thing it is you're not walking around. He's going to chase you. You're not going to let you good. You're not going to let you move forward. He's going to chase you. Praise God for it. He's going to correct you. Huh? Are you with me? He yeah. is. He's going to correct you. Just get it right, and Bob Papa will bless you. Huh? You want heaven? Get rid of the leaven. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Don't forget it. You want heaven? Get rid of the leaven. Hallelujah. Praise God. Because <laughs> when you've got heaven, you don't care about anything else anymore. When you don't care about anything else, God can give it to you. He won't destroy you. But what I've told the Lord is that I said, Father, no, I would say, Father, I want to grow and mature to where it's not mom first. I don't want to sin because I don't want to hurt. I wouldn't want to ever, I wouldn't do things, those kinds of things wrong because I wouldn't ever hurt my wife or my children. I want it to be, Father, I never want to sin or do anything wrong because I don't want to hurt you. And I'm just not there yet. But I want to be there. You see, at least I know where I'm at. Why? Because I deal with these things in prayer. My heart's transparent before the Lord. I make bare my life. I'm not trying to cover up anything because I'm not insecure. If you walk around insecure, oh, you got to try to boist yourself up. You can't see nothing. It's all a fake world. It's all a fake world. Are you with me? Because you can't handle the truth. You can't look and see that you got this gigantic word on your nose, on the tip of your nose kind of thing, right? you got to put powder on it and say it ain't there. You know what I'm saying. I'm trying to, we don't, we can't, we're too insecure to deal with the weaknesses or to deal with the, you know, the blemishes. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to have it. I'm going to have that love. I'm gonna, I, I've told Father, I said, Father, I'm so sorry. I love you so much. I love you in every way that I know. And I thank you for filling me with your love so that I can love you in even a greater way. But when I, when, when I think about why it is that I don't allow sin or I don't make wrong choices that continually, I mean, because I tell you right now, the more you walk in the anointing, the more you a target, the more you bombarded by things. I give no place to it. I don't even look. Huh? I mean, flirty girls come up and say, wow, I really like your truck or whatever. You know, it's just like, you know, it's either it's time to, to, to minister the gospel to you or just say nothing and walk away. Huh? Because it's inappropriate kind of thing. Are you with me? Everybody understand where we're at? Because, I mean, no, I know every one of you go through these similar types of things. It might as well just get here and get real because 
unless you're real with it, you're probably being taken out by it. I don't want it to be, I don't want it to be about, just about, I'm not going to bring shame to my wife. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to bring shame to the ministry. I'm not going to bring shame to my kids. It's kind of like this, my wife, my kids, the ministry. Right? I want to be father. I'm not going to bring shame. I'm not going to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. Jesus, I don't want to hurt you. Holy Spirit, I don't want to hurt you. The deeper relationship. Sometimes it's so hard for us because he's in an unseen realm. But we've got to recognize he's wanting to teach us something. He remains in an unseen realm because he wants to teach us something we couldn't get if he was visible to us like our wife, our husband, our kids are. He wants to work something in us that is so eternal, so settled, so deep. It's deeper than what we see. It's deeper than what we hear. It's deeper than what we smell. It's deeper than what we touch and feel. It's deeper than what we taste. It's the very depths of our being of what we feel and what we want and what we desire and what we need and what we long for. It's the deepest passion. It's the deepest emotion. And people, this is why you've got to grab a hold of your place and spending time in the Word and spending time in prayer because prayer really is a place of fellowship and talking with the Father and, and spending that place of interaction with Him where you're feeling and experiencing His manifest presence because it's not un, unrealized. His manifest presence is tangible and it's real. And the reality, need, that kind of reality needs to be in our life. Otherwise, we can easily get into fictional Christianity because there's nothing real. Can't sense nothing in any way. That, God never meant it to be that way. Now, the fire of the Holy Ghost is something you can sense. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. When we realize how valuable we are to Him and how meaningful we are to Him, when we think about the reality that our prayers are so precious to Him that He puts them in bowls or censers and they, they never lose their value. They're offered before Him continually, the prayers of the saints. When we realize our value to Him is so much that He's so affectionate towards us that He collects all of our tears in a bottle. That is amazing. I've never known anybody that loves like that, that's so affectionate like that. I mean, my wife is close. And, and today, today, Ruthiana said to me, he said, Dad, did you know that giving hugs deal with stress? Because I was getting a bit stressed. And I said, you know what? I don't feel that. I, I, that that's a girly thing, giving hugs deals with stress. You need a hug, okay. But I mean, you know, that's a girly thing. I'm not feeling that. I said, what I need to do is I need to do push-ups and exercise. So come here and help me. She knows how to do all the stretches and whatnot. But really, the reality of it is it just comes down to levels, just, to le just expresses their areas of spiritual immaturity. Okay? It really does. It just does. And when we see these things, what do we do? We say, Father... I just want to be absolutely in every way just like you. I don't want to be in every way just like a man. I told her, I said, baby, you just got to understand it's a man thing. <laughs> men don't, men don't <laughs> do stress by hugging. <laughs> and it's like, Father, that's not the way you are, is it? Because <laughs> he's so affectionate. He's so loving. He's so tender. He's so kind. I've never known of anyone who's, that I, I don't even feel this way about myself, that I would number my, the hair upon my head. I mean, dang it, but he does, and it's not a hyperbole, an exaggeration to make a point. Right. Father doesn't exaggerate. Mm. I want to know this love, don't you? To know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. Shoo. To be made conformed, conformable to his death. Hallelujah. I go anywhere you want me to go, Papa. I do whatever you want me to do. I delight to do thy will, O God. Hallelujah. Come on, people. Just get into this. Get, get into this lifestyle. Get into this speech pattern. Get into these thoughts. Get into these thinkings. These words of God are his thoughts. He's, he's taught us how to think. He's taught us how to speak right here. 
right here. Quit speaking other things and thinking other things. Ain't going to get you anywhere. With me. Talking about exercising yourself in these things of the spirit. His word spirit in his life. It's creative power. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the Lord, I put my trust. Why should you say to my soul, I need to get out of here. I need to flee away. And I got to go quick. I need wings to fly like a bird and get out of here now. I just want to get out of here. I just want to go. Huh? Are you with me? Are you with me? Anybody ever said that? I just got to get out of here. I just got to go. Just one person besides me. And she's only like 17. Maybe I should say it again. Anybody just need to ever say this? I got to get out of here. I got to go. It's too much. It's too overwhelming. I can't take it. I can't deal with this. Huh? Sure, everybody. I'll raise your hands for you. Okay. I'll just take it as a hand raised. Really what the psalmist says is all the time I didn't realize that what was really going on, what's really happening here, I've got to turn my eyes and look at the spiritual reality, the, see the spiritual attack for what it is because the wicked bend their bow. And I'm telling you, angels, powers of darkness, demon spirits, you in their sights. And if you don't think you are, somebody's lied to you. Listen, if you don't realize you're in a war, you better... You better Quickly realize it now, because you are. Satan hates the anointing. He hates anything that belongs to God. He believes that he owns you. He believes that you are his possession, that he can make you do whatever he wants you to do when he wants you to do it. To the limit which God then, you know, restrains him. Because, of course, I don't, it, you know, where would we be if Satan was able to, to fully elicit his, his, his power upon us. The Lord's not allowing us to be tempted above what we're able. He puts a limit and a restraint. So anything you're going through, God says you're able to deal with that. You can handle that. Say, I can handle that. I've got strength and power to deal with this. All I've got to, all I've got to do is be, be willing to be led to the rock, which is higher than I. Amen. When my heart is overwhelmed. When, when, I, when I'm being... Uh, you know, in a situation where these things are bombarding me right and left. The wicked has bent their bow and made ready their arrow upon their string. They are ready to do their sinister acts against the upright in heart. And that's what privily, actually the, Greek, the Hebrew word for privily is a sinister act. They're ready to commit sinister acts their deceitfulness, their tricks. You may be able to stand against all the tricks of Satan, all the wiles of the devil, or all the tricks of the devil. How are you going to be able to do that? Taking to yourself the whole armor of God. What does that look like? Overwhelmed in the glory, getting over in the realms of this beautiful presence of Jesus, this fellowship, this communion. I mean, the word of the Lord, as you begin to read the Bible, you'll find as you read the word of God in the morning you, that what will happen is the anointing will be activated in you. And you need to find that place. You have got to find that place that activates the anointing, that activates the flow of the Spirit of God through your life. It's the, it's the same as drinking of, of the water and a river flows out. 
Okay, it's that place where that fellowship, that communion, that strength and the power of the Holy Ghost, it's praise begins to flow out. Hopefully everybody in here has been baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire with the evidence of speaking in a heavenly language. If not, you need it because it activates that step out on the piquiata little bohopra that it just caught, it just builds you up, strengthens you, empowers you, gets you over into realm of seeing what you what eye cannot see, hearing what ear cannot hear, being able to discern the tricks of Satan and not being ignorant to his devices. These things are necessary if you're going to be remnant, if you're going to walk as a light into a lost and dying world, if you're going to be an example of a place to stand an identity to think of, to consider the fact that God has put us in his stead that we're here standing as his ministers of reconciliation with his with his authority with his power and divine ability to fully represent heaven wow he's entrusted us with such things well we've got to understand the way of it the activity of it we can't be so caught up in our jobs and our work. I had so many things going on today, and, and they were primarily ministry things, but I had too many ministry things going on. Sometimes it gets a, just a bit overwhelming. You get hit from, you know, sometimes it's like when it rains, it pours. You're getting hit from 20 different directions. You're like, oh, okay, we got the threshold now. We're saying all you need to do is get a hug, give a hug. You know, I said, I, honestly, I do that for others, not for myself. I need to understand the other, this other part that you've got. It, that you got. I, I don't know that yet. Just because I don't know it, does that mean it's not true? No. It means it's something I need to discover. You with me? Do you understand what I'm trying to, the point we're trying to make here? And understand that in the midst of this, David is showing us a contest that's going on. He's t showing us a contest. He's showing us that really our choices and, the, and the, the decisions that we make is ultimately going to result in others being able to see the high ground of victory. It's like, you know, the person is running with the flag and they're waving the flag so all the rest of the troops can see, come here, this is where you're supposed to rally, where we're gonna win where we have the enemy on the run. And so he says, you know, basically in response to, you know, I got to get out of here. It's like, wait a minute. And let, if, the right, if the foundation be destroyed, what will the righteous do? There's got to be a place to stand here. There's got to be a footing here. And he says, the Lord is in his holy temple. He's right here. We know exactly where he's at. We know where our trust is. We know where our help is, okay? The Lord's throne is in the heavens. His eyes behold us. They try us. They're right. He's seeing. He's not. He didn't. He hasn't taken his eye off of me. His eyes on me. Can you see his eyes on you? Can you see him? Have you, have you been willing to place the Lord before you? To put him before you? And on your right hand that you should not be moved? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Come on, people. Come on. Did you see father involved in our life that nothing that was going on in our life escapes him he's there to be our defense he's there to be our help <laughs> he's a very present help in time of need <laughs> hallelujah the lord tries the righteous the lord's going to he's going to develop us he's going to prepare us in all, every good work what a beautiful thing are you are you part of the righteous are you the righteous that means you're going to be instructed in the ways of the lord the wicked he hates their soul that's what it says. I'm sorry if you didn't. If that offended you, no, I'm not. But the wicked, that person that loves violence or loves iniquity, God's soul hates him. We, I thought God so loved the world. He does. He so loved the world and their sin and deceit that he gave his only begotten son. But he doesn't have a love relationship with the world. He doesn't have a relationship with the world. He just, can, he, he loves the world, he extends his love to rescue them. But if you, Jesus said, if you obey me, then my father will love you. That's pretty radical, isn't it? That's relationship. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Are you in a relationship? Amen. Hallelujah. Are you in a relationship? And of course, the rest of this gets, this, this next one gets really tough. Upon the wicked, he shall rain snares. Fire, brimstone, a horrible tempest shall be the portion of their cup. I'm not doing that. The first thing you want to understand is you want to define for yourself what wickedness is so that you make sure that you don't do any of that. Because God can't lie and he's not changing any of his word. That's what he says right there. For the, Lord, for the righteous Lord loves righteousness. And his face upholds the upright. Wow. Wow. Can I be that? No problem. And so I just want to show you that you can be this. No problem. Romans 3, 24, just quickly. This is better than food. This is better than sleep. Okay. I'm going to get you built up in the faith before you leave here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start Romans 4, 21. But now the righteousness of God, God's righteousness, not man's righteousness, not the right righteousness of the law, not the righteousness of the prophet, but the kind of righteousness that God has. God's righteousness has been now manifested. Even, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, is upon all them that believe. I got it. Say it's mine. I have the righteousness of God. It came to me by faith in Jesus Christ. Let me just describe to you what faith in Jesus Christ is. Faith in Jesus Christ means you get born again. You can become a new creation. You get a new, brand new nature. Huh. You can reshaped in his image and likeness. So now you can be taught in the ways of God. One other verse of scripture real quickly. First Corinthians. Or forgive me. Second Corinthians. Chapter 5 verse 21. Look at that. Look at that. That is radical. Look at that. Hallelujah. Ah. He who knew no sin became the sin offering for us. Are you looking at that? That we may be made the righteousness of God in him. That's who I am. That's my identity. I am not a sinner. I am a righteous one. God loves, his, the righteous Lord loves righteousness. And his face or his presence is there manifested to the upright in heart. Come on. With the heart man believes unto righteousness. I'm not believing unto sin. And with my mouth confession is made unto salvation. I've been regenerated by the washing of the water. Amen. Amen. I mean, come on. And the renewing of the Holy Ghost. I got a Holy Spirit. I've been given a Holy Spirit that's hooked up with the Holy Spirit. Wow. Come on. I mean, just grab a hold of it. Live it. Love it. Do it. Say it. Praise God for it. Give thanks. Find yourself so ecstatic about it. By the time you come to the meeting, you out sing me with the microphone. I mean, your heart just, you're just that shout, that praise. Let it get loud. The earth needs to hear the high praises of God coming up out of your belly that is a direct result of you loving Him, of a relationship with Him, of an interaction with Him, of the power of God having free course in our lives. Not frustration, not disappointment, not discouragement, not condemnation, not all this other stuff. Not spiritual Twinkies making you sick by the time you get to the meeting. Can't eat right. In Jesus' name. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, told him to follow after righteousness and godliness. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, rather, to have the armor of righteousness on. Hallelujah. <laughs> he tells us the kingdom of God that we, you and I are supposed to be in and seek first and foremost above everything else is righteousness. Peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. There is an identity that can only be manifested through our lives by the manifest presence of Jesus. 
by a glory of the Holy Ghost being revealed through our lives. If there's anything, dear people, that we've got to help God's folks understand is how to be in it. Because everybody knows you've been in a year in a culture where you've learned how to be able to, to how to learn information, retain information, you know, recite information. It's time to take the information, do something with it. And there's a lot of people who are filled with information, but they do not have. They, they have knowledge, but they don't have the understanding, the ability to take the knowledge and apply it and do something with it. That's another realm. It's another realm. I've watched folks learning. I've watched what, what, what way people learn. A lot of people can just retain crazy amounts of knowledge. And there's a lot of people that just have understanding. They might not have knowledge, but what they have, a lot of knowledge, but what they have, they do amazing things with what they know. Father wants to give a spirit of understanding in the knowledge of him so that what we know about him can be applied in our lives, seen, viewed in our life, the fruits of it. I was so blessed by Pastor Steve and what he said about we pastors do judge. We are to judge. We're supposed, we're supposed to judge fruits. We're supposed to tell you if your fruit's right or if it's wrong, if what you're doing is correct or if it's wrong. And then what are you supposed to do? Huh? You're supposed to agree and, and say, okay, Lord, help me. I want to change and change. Huh? It's true. It's true. When you go out and you go out into public, how many of you just brush your hair? I'm going to just take that as everybody raise their hand, not just two. Because you're saying, of course I brush my hair. What are you talking about? Brush my hair. What are you talking about? Why is your hair and your appearance, outward appearance, more valuable to you than the spiritual display of his joy, of his grace? To where the anointing is so strong upon you, you know what's going on in somebody's life. You're ready to help them. You're ready to love them. You're ready to have compassion. You're ready to show mercy. Come on. Because if that joy isn't there, if that love isn't there, if that glory isn't there, you'll have no word for them. You're just going to walk right on by them. You're just going to be, you're just going to be in your own little world. It's like the, it's like the horse to plow with. You just got these blinders on. The thing I got to go do. Just taking it off tonight. Taking off the blinders. Close your eyes and see the blinders go up. No, I'm just kidding. I would like to walk you through it, whatever it takes. I mean, I, I'm going to say this until it, go, until it gets, sinks deep down into your heart. There has to be the manifest presence of the Lord to convey what Father wants. Not just the word that declares it. Huh? There has to be the manifest presence of the Lord to convey these things to our lives. Amen. Stand with me, everybody. I don't want to stop. Let me just tell you. At 8 o'clock, when you guys really started hitting the vein, I didn't want to stop. I wanted you to keep going. Now, I'm going to ask you tonight. I'm going to ask you to keep going. I'm asking you to go home and, and find that realm and keep going. The word of God is given to us to be able to understand how to enter into this realm. He's come to teach us his ways, to lead us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, to show us the paths of life. And he's given us an entrance into this realm. <laughs> it's here where you live in divine health, where sickness can't get on you. Sick, everybody can get sick around you. Not sick, not going to get on you. It's not on you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. John G. Lake was not saved very long. Thank you. John G. Lake was not saved very long. He was just an insurance guy. But what it is, is he got saved in the manifest glory of heaven. In, the, in, in uh, Alexander Dowie's meetings. And Alexander Dowie had this incredible manifest presence of God. And out of it, so many people got healed, signs, wonders, miracles. Faith was activated. It's amazing the things. If you never studied about Alexander Dowie, do it. It's amazing. God showed him to start a, the church, 
moved the church towards community, and he started um, Zion in Illinois. I'm losing a bunch of people here. This really, we're not done yet, honestly. I just, I really want you to just pay attention to what I'm saying, because you need this. Understand, Satan's got a world of distractions. He's got a whole bag of distraction tricks to keep you from getting what God wants you to have. On a daily basis, 24 hours, out, 24 hours a day. And you're going to have to understand how to deal, not be ignorant to his devices. Okay? Stay with me. And, then, and that's how John G. Lake came into the kingdom. And then he went right from that to Azusa Street. Wow. So he goes, he goes to Africa. And he's got it. Why? He's got it. He understands it. And I mean, I really started getting, the fire of God started getting kindled in my life reading John G. Lake stuff and getting what he understood because I, I had seen it through growing up in my life. I'd seen it being in, in a lot of revival meetings and I understood it and it just, all took, it just awakened me that much more as I'm just reading John G. Lake's life and, and just started reading everything that John G. Lake ever wrote. And um, where, he just, where he depended upon the manifest presence of God's divine glory. When you all of a sudden you say, I need the manifest presence. I will live in the manifest presence. The tangible glory of heaven. So then you can actually feel on your body. This beauty. Knowing first and foremost how to step into that. Because I believe a lot of people want, I believe everybody wants it. They just don't know how to step in. You're just going to, God may tell you, put, God may spit in the dirt, make mud, stick it in your eye. Say, mud in your eye, go wash it off now. And you may say, I didn't like this. <laughs> he may tell you, go dip seven times in the Jordan, the muddy Jordan. You say, I didn't like this. There's a lot of things that really challenge our will. We become very self-willed. Father said, don't do it that way. I don't want you to do it that way. I want you to do it this way. See, I have to be careful because David's doing a good job. He's doing a great job. I love him. He's doing a great job, but he's changing the atmosphere. And he's got to learn how to be sensitive to that. And we first got to learn how to discern the atmosphere. When you live in the, when you live under the, when you live in the atmosphere of heaven, you live in the atmosphere of glory. You live in the atmosphere, the divine working of the power of God. Then it's easy to discern, isn't it? Huh? If you live under stress, you live under turmoil, live under discouragement, you, know, you live under, you know, the, uh, you know the, the passion to succeed, this and that and the other thing, those kinds of things. It's a different atmosphere. It's a different realm. So he... Knowing this place, he goes in Africa, and they, there was the plague going on. Worse than worse than Ebola, the plague. Worse than Ebola, kill you quicker. Okay. He said, "I'm the temple of the living God." That's what he said. He said, "I'm the temple of the living God." To believe it that much. Come on, think about this. If this because I'm trying to get you. I'm just trying to stir identity in you which can only be stirred and realized through relationship. A conscious reality. Something bigger than what your dad and mom told, about, told you about you. Something bigger than what devils told you about you. Something bigger than what people at the schoolyard told you about you. Something bigger than what teachers told you about you. This is what God told Amen. you about you. And he believed from this relationship with the Lord, having been born in that realm, having ultimately Given himself over to the dependency and the value of a manifest glory. He said, put the plague on me. I'm the temple of the living God. It will die. Measurably. And he went, he went from there. And, you know, basically, he, would, he continued to have a contest showing the power of God being manifested on a measurable scale. We would place a hand on somebody who has cancer and all you could see was a, had a big tumor. All you could see, tumor was gone. All you could see was the print of his hand burned in the person's back. Come on, man. Signs, wonders, and miracles. Have these things, have God, has God stopped doing them? No. They're right here, right now. Are they somewhere else? There's never, all the mantles of heaven never left 
the earth. And just like Elijah's mantle fell to the earth and Elisha picked it up, every mantle of Christ Jesus is right here on this earth. Every mantle of, that a God has ever given is right here. I mean, just to try to create a, a, a picture gram of it, you know. It's right here, right here, right now. It's just, it, 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 it's the block. It's the blockage. It's the mental blockage. It, it's, it's, it's the mind being distracted and convoluted with other cares and other interests. That causes us to not be able to see what eyes are not, what eyes can't see, but God the Holy Ghost will show us. To hear what ears can't hear, but God the Holy Ghost will, will cause us to hear. <sighs> to understand what hearts can not understand, but Papa's here to show us. Don't have to look. You can have them right now. It's mine. The miles today. It's mine. You can have these things. It's yours. What am I talking about? Relationship. You can have this unlimited food of salad among Kataya. Un, you have unlimited, Jonathan, you have unlimited access to God. I know it's unbelievable. It's hard to imagine. You might think you need to get a yarmulke and a prayer shawl and say some, you know, brokata. But you don't need to do none of that stuff. Huh? Oh, everybody's got all the ideas of what kind of thing you need to get into. Huh? No way, man. It's right here right now. It's right here right now. An unlimited access to God by the Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can I show you how it works? Thank you, Lord. You're amazing, God. You're amazing, Lord. Wow. 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 You're amazing. And then that just, you live that in that all day. People, I want to tell you, if you live under pressure and stress in a fight, in a turmoil, get out of it. Say, well, that's how I make my living. Well, that's how you're making your dead in. <laughs> so, you know, now you're making your living. It's how you're making your death. I didn't think, that's not making a living. It's making a death. Let God be your living. The Spirit of grace be your living. Your job makes a... You know, a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde out of you, get out of it. Your job makes you, defines you to be some whatever, you know, stressed out whatever, cranky person, get out of it. Uncompassionate person, get out of it. Get Jesus, get the power of the Holy Ghost in everything that you're doing. In Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. In Jesus' name. 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 I command sorrow to leave this place. Sorrow is a spirit. Sorrow is a spirit. It's not an attitude of the image and likeness of God. It's not an attitude of the human nature. It's a spirit that is evil. I command it to go. And I, in Jesus' name, I pray that you be strong from this day forward. Because you command it to go. And everything else that would be unlike God. Unforgiveness. Bad attitudes. Discouragement. Whatever, the thing may, whatever it may be. Oh, Rabba, Sipia, Rebeni. Say, no good thing will the Lord withhold from those who walk upright. And I'm walking upright. Amen. I'm not all bent over. Not all crooked. I'm walking upright. I'm walking right here. Amen. I'm doing, I'm living, I'm living like God told me to live, like he created me to live. Amen. I'm not crawling on the ground, slithering around. I'm walking upright. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody just raise your hands towards heaven. 
Just raise your hands towards heaven. I said, just be filled with the Spirit right now. <laughs> Say, Lord, fill me with your joy. Oh, Lord, let your love flow out of me like rivers. Father, fill me with your boldness and your confidence. Lord, let your manifest presence be all that I know about me. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Just, you can just, you can almost don't, you almost don't even have to say nothing. You don't even have to say nothing. You're standing here with your hands lifted up. Your presence, I mean, power of God's here. Just all you need to do is just receive. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we love you. Father, your divine power, and your divine grace that has brought to us this divine life. You're so amazing. You're so amazing, Lord. You're so amazing. Whew. Whew. Let me say this to you people. When you get real tired, it's hard to function flow in the anointing because you have an overwhelming human sense that's restraining you. Make sure that you're taking care of yourself, sleeping right. You become overwhelmed with stress and you live under stress. You, that, 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 is, that, is a, that is a spiritual place that you do not want to live in. It will kill you. It makes it very difficult for you to step in to the things of the Spirit, especially when you're not skilled in stepping into the things of the Spirit. Just go ahead and determine today that you just, you're, you're not going to give yourself to that kind of a lifestyle. Determine today you're not going to give yourself to that kind of a lifestyle. You're going to find a place to come rest in the Lord. Amen. Come relax. How many of you practice relaxing on a daily basis? How do you relax? I pray you relax in the presence of the Lord. Because that's the best relaxing that's going on. Your body needs rest. Right? So you go to sleep. Some people sleep a long time. Some people are like, it's amazing how long they sleep. Whatever you need. But how about the rest in the spirit? How about the place of rest? He said, I give you, I give you these tongues, these stammering lips, and these other languages, and I'll cause you to rest. Jesus said, all that you are laboring and heavy laden, come unto me, and I'll give you rest. There's a realm of my manifest presence. If you're coming to Jesus, you're in his manifest presence. You're interacting with him. There's a rest there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I pray in Jesus' name that every person in this place has a, the ability to understand from this day forward how to, to step into this realm and live in this realm.
of glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. I pray that you'll determine from this day forward that you're going to come with singing and rejoicing in the presence of the Lord, that you're not going to wait till you get here to get your Thanksgiving engine started up and then find out that you got a couple spark plugs missing and you got to have a miracle. But it's already been all, it's, everything's all tuned up. Hallelujah. Hurrah say Amen. I pray that you never go out anymore into public undressed. Ah, 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 ah. I pray in Jesus' name from now on. You get well, you get fixed up and, ha, ah, and beautified. Hallelujah. With the presence of the Lord. Before you step out in the public. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Well, come worship the Lord with your tithes and your offerings. And if you have, if there's any of you that have a need for anything, you're sick in your body, you're tormented in your spirit, you just feel intimidated and fearful, whatever goes on, whatever's taking place, you just need some help. Uh, God is here to help you. He is here to help you. If you've ever said, Lord, help me, I could guarantee you his answer is, I am. Help is here. Help is here. So just come worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for spiritual growth. I thank you for spiritual growth and increase in every person's life in this place. Ha <laughs> ha. Thank you, Father, for the anointing. Thank you, Father, for the anointing. Thank you, Father, for the anointing. The anointing of your word, the anointing of your spirit. Thank you, Father, for your manifest presence. Thank you for this glory realm, Jesus, Lord Jesus. We'll find a bunch of people around you, hug them, tell them that you love them, bless them in Jesus' name. Understand, uh, we're here, we're here praying for people. I'm going to be praying for people. But you can, you know, you can feel free to just bless those that are around you. Hug them, tell them that you love them. Talk about the things of the kingdom. Let God lay, your, lay something on your heart for the person that's near you.